Just a couple family matters before we dig into the scriptures. Um, if you weren't here Thursday night, we had a good meeting here on Thursday night with our uh, regional leader. We are now officially, um, well, they call it development, but we're like a church plant. It's like we're rebooting. It's like a restart. Sometimes that's good in our personal lives and in a church, just to step back and restart. That's where we're at. And I'm very excited about this journey ahead. Um, we'll be mobilizing a whole new leadership uh, board as we move forward on this. Because every pastor needs a leadership team to keep them accountable and keep them encouraged. And we do church as a team. And we need you. We need your input. Uh, we want to be one of those churches that uh, knows that the value of team. That we're in this together. We're like a, a family together. Um, just to let you know, Kent and Jill Cox have, have resigned, and they're, uh, God's leading them in another direction. We're praying God's blessing over them. They've done so much at the Outpost Church. We're praying God's blessing in them as they transition. 
and we need we need more help. We need we need to be together and on this journey together to develop a mission and reach our community for Christ. We want your help. We want your input. We want to become more and more a church that we, we listen to each other and there's no secrets and we just talk things through and you don't have to wonder what's going on. We, we are honest with each other unless it's relational things and that's the only reason that our board wants to keep confidence is when that is the case. But we want to be a church that talks openly and there's nothing that we hide from, from you. We want to be a team. So in the coming months, we'll be talking about what that looks like and mobilizing a new leadership team. What does that look like with elders and deacons and deaconesses and women in ministry? And we, we are, we're a church that involves women in ministry. We, I, I'm a pastor that would not want to be on a leadership team without women on it. We need women and the input of women. So we'll be talking about that as well as, as we move forward as a church because we want to be the kind of family, a church family that God wants us to be. And the kind of church family that God empowers us to be, that Jesus made possible. I'd like to read a scripture this morning from chapter 19 of John, as we continue to think, think in this, this vein of family, and what that means, that we're a church family. So the setting is that Jesus is on the cross, in great agony, in, in pain. And as he's hanging on that cross, most people wouldn't be able to even say any kind of t intelligent words <laughs> hanging on a cross after the beatings and the sufferings and the pain that he's been enduring. <laughs> he's on a cross. And it says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, Here's your son. And to the disciple, here's your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her home, and took her into his home. Do you catch what's going on there? Jesus, in this incredible agony, is saying something that's obviously a passion for him. It's crucial for him. It's so important for him that it needs to be said, even in the incredible suffering that he was in. And what he's doing is saying, you guys are family. Mothers and brothers and sisters together as a family. That's what we are. His death on a cross is what made that possible. You know, first, a few verses later, after what we just read, Jesus said, it is finished. It's done. You now can be forgiven and free. So that you can have a relationship with a holy God. You can be cleansed and forgiven to have a relationship with a holy God. You can receive that forgiveness. It's finished. And you can be forgiving. You can forgive other people. In the strength and in the power of the almighty God. He made that possible by his finished work on the cross. Amen. Amen. We can actually say with a genuine heart. I forgive you. We forgive each other on this journey as a spiritual family, as brothers and sisters and moms and dads for each other. So maybe that very passage in Jesus is remembering back in Matthew 12, what we've been looking at, what we started looking at last week. Look at this verse, these verses in Matthew 12, verses 46 to 50. We want to dive into this passage once again this morning. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside wanting to speak to him. And someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside waiting to speak to you. And he replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. That's what we're looking at. Jesus sees this as crucial for us to know that he makes possible a spiritual family that is very important to him. So we want to we want to lean into that. What does that look like to be a spiritual family together? To do the will of the Father together. And we mentioned last week that the will of the Father, first and foremost, for every single human being is to first come to faith in Jesus. To surrender to Jesus. To give my heart, my soul, my mind, 
completely surrendered to Jesus and to follow him. And then we are reborn into a spiritual family where together we have a Holy Father together that we love together as a family. So what does it look like to be a community that's a family? Last week we talked about courage. It's courage is needed to be a family. A courageous community, we mentioned this, a courageous community of faith understands that we are a spiritual family in a spiritual battle together. This is not just a game. This is not easy. If you've made a decision to follow Jesus, I hope somebody told you, you just entered a war. You just put a target on your back. Oh, it's wonderful to follow Jesus, and it's great, and it's all might, and we have this hope and this promise and this joy that the world can't touch and the circumstances can't take away. It's incredible to be a follower of Jesus. Yes, but it's also really hard. And we are in a spiritual battle, and we are in a battle together. You know, my time in, in the military, one of the, my, one of my biggest takeaways, I think, from my short season in the military, I didn't serve real long, only three years, but I learned a powerful lesson in my few years there, the power of team. It is incredible what a group of people on mission together can accomplish. And how much more in the kingdom of God? When we understand that we're a family, we're like a spiritual army as a family. We are God's military unit. He's the commanding officer. And if we understand the value of team, it's incredible what we can accomplish in Trinity County to build the kingdom together as a family, as a team, doing church as a team. Now, many of you haven't been in the military, but you understand this from team sports. The church is a team sport, and we do this together, and that honors and glorifies the king. So one of the things we need to be able to help each other and knowing that we're in a battle, in the spiritual battle, we need the courage to help each other identify the triggers and the footholds of our enemy. Sometimes we need other people to help us with that. Sometimes we can be under some kind of deception and we don't see it ourselves. So we need a family to remind us that there is a kingdom of darkness and that kingdom of darkness desires to rob our capacity and our desire to do the will of the Father. So as, as a family, we help each other with that. Yeah, we want to pursue the will of our Father together, and we help each other on that journey. And sometimes that means we help each other identify the things that we might be have a blind spot. I would say most of us in the room have some kind of blind spot. And I hope you have a friend that is able to speak into that with honesty and love and kindness, but with truth, to identify those blind spots. Because sometimes it's those areas of our life where we're not even you know, intentionally trying to invite you know, the enemy, the, the devil, the kingdom of darkness to do anything. It, it can happen just by a small little crack. We had the, uh, the bug guy came to our house a little while ago because we were having problems with cockroaches. And we still use the bug guy at, uh, that we had when we were living over on Pioneer. Same, same guy, great guy. And he's always very friendly as, as he kills all the bugs. So he came and he walked me around the house and said, see the light coming through that door frame? I know it's not much, but it only takes a crack for the cockroaches and the pests to get through into your house. So I went around and put sealer on all the doors, and, and he took care of the cockroaches. But my thought was, that's exactly how it is in this spiritual battle in which we fight together. As it, sometimes it only takes a crack to open up the door for the enemy to get a foothold on our life. I, I hope you're aware of that, and I hope you have friends that will make you even more aware of that when they see it. They'll love you enough to say, hey, that could be a crack for the enemy to use in your life, you know. The Bible has a number of you know, spiritual inventories, I call them, where when we read those, those it's wise to say, okay, what, what there do I need to tune into? Is God telling me, hey, this is in your life right now, and it could be a crack for the enemy. It could be an open door for the enemy to get a stronghold, a foothold in your life. Let's close that door together. Let's reject that in Jesus' name. Let's take care of that because we know that it can be a problem. Sometimes we open the door to darkness, not intentionally, even sometimes it's intentional. Getting involved, in, the Bible talks about getting involved in the occult or believing false teachings. Or a big one is unforgiveness. 
that can open a door. Are you aware of that? Unforgiveness, even if it's a crack, can open the door for the enemy to get a foothold. And so that's one that we need to deal with. Consider these words in Ephesians 4. Here's a good inventory. Here's one of the many that are in Scripture. Ephesians 4. This is like a spiritual inventory. When you read passages like this, it's, it's good to say, okay, is there anything there that God's telling me? Be watchful of this. That you have, might have a problem with this. Let's highlight this. Ephesians 4 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Why? Because God wants to cleanse us and purify us and forgive us, but he also wants us to close any doors that we might have given the enemy to have authority in our life. To close the doors, seal up the cracks that might have allowed darkness to enter in. That's why it says in, you know, a foothold can be established through things like bitterness or anger and this is a verse that we looked at Thursday night, Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Uh, Rob Douglas shared a bunch of verses on Thursday night. It was really, really good, and we had a, a time of prayer. And that's one of the ones he shared. Because it's sometimes, and you know this, sometimes a conflict that you suddenly erupts, and it was a long time in coming, because... Somebody got angry about something and they went to sleep on it repeatedly. Didn't deal with it. And the anger just kind of festers and it becomes a wound and bitterness can take hold. Anger is something, bitterness is something, unforgiveness is something that can open a door to the enemy to have a foothold. And then you're being used by the enemy even if you don't know it. This is so crucial that we understand this aspect of spiritual warfare. If, if, the God's, if God shines a light on an area of my life like anger or bitterness, or unforgiveness, I need to do something about that. And if you see a friend that is giving in to that, we are wise to help them because we love them enough to help them to be able to walk in victory. So what do you do when the Holy Spirit shines a light on anger or unforgiveness or bitterness or any of those things? Any sin in our life, spiritual pride, anything that we recognize when we do these spiritual inventories in the scriptures, we recognize, oh, that's one that... I think God is talking to me about that because I feel a little conviction right now. And then we deal with it. When God shines a light on that, first of all, we pray. And we confess. God, I'm realizing right now that, yeah, I, I've got an issue right there. I want to deal with that. Help me. I'm sorry, Lord. We say I'm sorry to God. We pray. We confess. We say I'm sorry to God. And often that means saying I'm sorry to somebody else. I'm sorry that I... Did that. I'm sorry that I let that happen. We forgive people. We let God forgive us and then we extend that to other people. We extend forgiveness. Why? Because God wants us to. He purify us and cleanse us and keep the door closed to any kind of things that could disrupt my spiritual walk with him. And if I ever open the door to darkness, I ask Jesus to close that door in Jesus' name. And take away all authority of it. The kingdom of darkness has nothing to use against me. I'm coming clean. I confess it. God, I close that door in Jesus' name. Jesus, would you close that door? And I'm, I rebuke it in the name of Jesus, in the powerful name of Jesus, and it works. It actually is very powerful. The name of Jesus. So powerful that when I realize there's something in my life I need to get out, and I confess it, and I say, God, I want no part of the kingdom of darkness using that in any way. I close that door in Jesus' name, and he does. It's powerful. And if you've done that, you know it. You can sense it. You feel the victory of it because the name of Jesus is so incredibly powerful. And that's how the battle works, the powerful name of Jesus. And he uses us and helps us. And sometimes we need family. We need other people to help us to do that to pray through it with us, especially if it's something deep-seated. So we help each other as a spiritual family, as the army of God together. We pray for each other. That's another thing we need as a family. A courageous spiritual family spends time in prayer to our Father. It says Ephesians, in Ephesians 3, 14, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Yeah, you know, I... 
mentioned last week, I'd like to start in a few weeks some Wednesday night prayer gatherings. Um, I would really like us to just get together and pray. Um, you've done that. We've done that in various settings. But right now in this season that we're in, in this restart, in this new, new fresh start as, as a church family, I want to invite us to just get together and pray. So we'll let you know the when and the where and the time on that in a couple of weeks. We'd like to do it in a couple of weeks and I'll let you know it ahead of time. Um, Dan and Darla, uh, you said yes to it, but I didn't ask you to say it publicly, so now I already did. <laughs> they, the Sisters in Christ building where we meet for Sisters in Christ, they volunteered to let us use that building, that room in their home to, to gather together. So I want to invite you into that. Um, it won't be your, just your standard old-fashioned prayer meeting. It's going to be a powerful time together of dialogue and opening, opening the word together, seeking God together and the fullness of his presence and the, the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to spend some time in prayer together so that we can catch God's vision for us in moving forward. That's crucial that we become more and more a praying family, a family that prays for each other and seeks the heart of God for us as a family. Something else, a courageous church family practices love, doing good to each other. Listen to these words from Galatians 6.10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. We treat everybody with goodness, the fruit of the Spirit. I, it, I'm just drawn to the fact that it says especially in the family. And the reason for that is that people out, not, not in the church setting, not people who aren't believers yet, see us doing that, treating each other with goodness. It's contagious. People want to be involved in, in something like that. And so we treat each other with honor and, and with respect. Not because any of us is perfectly worthy of honor, but because we're honorable. We're honorable people. And so we treat each other as a family. We honor and respect each other. We want to be that kind of people. We want to be, we want to be a real people, don't we? who are really experiencing real change because Jesus is a real savior who really loves us. He wants us to experience that love and to change our hearts and to step into that in a real way to be real people together and live that out in a way that's contagious in the world around us. Have courage to do that. Have courage to encourage other people out of love. Something else that is involved with that in a family we practice resolving conflicts. When an argument ar arises, when there's tension in a relationship that comes up, we, we are intentional about seeking to do everything we can do to resolve that. Why? Because God wants us to. And it's a beautiful, purifying thing when it happens. It's what love does. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to say, I'm sorry. Hey, look at the person next to you and say, I'm sorry. Now, if you want to be serious about that, you say, what for? But I just want to make sure that everybody in the room can get those words out of your mouth without a problem. If you could not say that, you've got a problem. I'm sorry. Not just flippantly, but it's a powerful thing to say that I made a mistake and admitting our mistakes, being real about it and honest about it, and then forgiving each other and moving forward. That's the powerful kind of stuff that can happen in a real family who trust God as our father together and it takes courage so we practice what you could call biblical peacemaking now on, on Thursday night Rob gave us the most powerful time for me I, I think he gave these sheets of uh, verses about biblical peacemaking and they, they were two-sided he, he went through them with us and then he had us all get together in groups and we picked a few of these verses and we prayed them that, that to me was the most powerful thing that happened on Thursday night the sense of praying together, these kind of verses that talk about making peace with each other. We touched on this a little bit last week, but you could really summarize that with, with three Gs. There's a lot of verses in the Bible about making peace with each other, being biblical peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. And there's a lot of scriptures that, that refer to that. I would summarize them. I didn't come up with this, but the peacemaking ministries came up with this. But three Gs that are really powerful. First is glorify God. That's always the first intent. Glorify God. So when I realize I'm in a conflict or having tension in a relationship, the first question I ask is, God, how do I glorify you in this? Sometimes that just means uh, it's really not 
that bad. I just need to let it run off my back and, and move on and, and forget. But if it's troubling me, I, I don't just let it go. The first question is, how do I glorify God in this? And secondly, and this is crucial, and often this step is missed, get the log out of my own eye. That's Matthew chapter 7. It talks about, how can I help my brother with a speck in his eye when I've got a log in my eye? And so that's the second G. And it's crucial for a conflict in a relationship. What's my part in this? How do I clean up my side of the street? What are you teaching me in this, God? Maybe you made this conflict happen just so you could teach me about something I need to deal with in my life. How do I get the log out of my own eye? That's the second really important step. And then go. Not to somebody else and spread rumors, but go to the person involved. You go straight to them, one-on-one. -on -one. And if that doesn't work, then you take two or three witnesses, it says in Matthew 18. If that doesn't work, you take it to the leadership of the church. There's a process in the Bible. Why? Because God wants us to resolve conflicts and be peacemakers when tension arises. Because I guarantee you, a church plant now or fresh church start, I guarantee you at some point, I'm going to make you mad about something. <laughs> I'm just telling you up front, I'm going to say something that you might not like. So please, come and let's talk it through. You know how that often is. It's like, oh, that's not what I meant you to hear. Here's what I was thinking. And then you resolve it. You figure it out. Don't just let it fester. I make that commitment to you. If you say something to me that I'm, you know, it's, I'm really struggling with it, I'm going to come to you and let's talk this through as brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's get it out and be honest about it. Let's talk about it and then pray together. Let's, let's do that because that's what God tells us to do. We're open. We're honest. We talk to each other. We go to each other with the goal, not of being right, but with the goal to gently restore the relationship because that's what will bring glory to God. I've had several in my ministry years of those kind of conflicts that I didn't think would get resolved. And then not too far down the road, all of a sudden we worked it out and then we were able to give glory to God for that. It's like, wow, I didn't think we were ever going to be friends again. Now we're like best friends. That can happen in God's economy. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing when it does. God wants us to have the courage to resolve conflicts. Now let me note this in an abusive relationship, you don't want to try and restore, restore that. It's not wise to try and restore a relationship with somebody that's abused you, whether that's emotional abuse or spiritual abuse or verbal abuse or physical abuse, whatever that is. It's not wise to try and resolve that, especially by yourself, unless there's clear repentance and remorse and an I'm sorry kind of a posture in it. Then, then it's wise to, to try to do what we can. But we don't need to. There, there's nothing I've seen in Scripture that requires us to, re, to restore a relationship with somebody that's unrepentant and that you're not going to get it solved right now. It's not going to happen. Don't put yourself back in that abusive situation. You can forgive them. And we have to forgive. We have to extend forgiveness. But it doesn't mean that you're going to be best friends right away. It means I don't need to put myself in, in a situation where I'm going to be emotionally abused again. There's allowance for God working in the midst of it as we step back. So if, if that's you, if, you've, if you're really having a hard time with forgiving somebody that really abused you, whatever kind of abuse that is, work on forgiveness. Sometimes it's a process. It takes time. Pray. Get counseling. Get the family of believers to, to help walk that journey with you so that you can get to that point where you can really say, I've forgiven and I'm moving on and I'm not letting the enemy have any kind of a foothold in that. It's so important that we learn how to resolve conflicts and have the courage to do so. Here's one more. In the family of faith, we need to stir each other in a hunger for God's word. I was reading Deuteronomy 29 the other day, a fascinating verse that I encountered. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. I just love that verse because it's saying something really kind of cool. When we become children of God, it's like God starts revealing secrets to us. That's pretty cool. He gives us the ears to hear what somebody that's not a child of God, who doesn't have the Spirit of God, who has not surrendered to Jesus, may not be able to hear unless the Spirit gives them some 
divine capacity in the moment, but there are many things that God tells us as his children. I mean, can you picture your dad, your heavenly father, getting you up into his lap and saying, I want to tell you a secret. There's just, there's just something meaningful about that. It's relational building, and it's special that God is our father and does that with us as children. He, he tells us like these family secrets. So in Matthew 13, we have this wonderful story called the parable of the sower. I, I want to read that for us because it, it's so profound, this parable of the sower. And a parable is a story that, that teaches biblical truth. It teaches some profound truth, and it's a common story. Everybody can get the story, but unless you know, you're really tuned into God's heart, you may not understand what the, what the meaning of it is. So he tells a parable as a story, and his children can tune in to the real meaning of it. So it's a, a parable reveals secrets to those with the ears to hear. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells this short little story, this parable of the sower. L listen to these words in Matthew 13, verse, verse 3. He says, A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. The birds came and ate it up. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched. And they were withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell in good soil where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. And then Jesus says at the end of this whole story, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. So he's saying, there's a meaning behind this. I'm not just telling you a fun story. There's a meaning behind this. Tune in. And then he goes on to share and explain the meaning of that in verses 18 through 24. I'll encourage you to read that on your own. Maybe this week it's a great parable. But basically the, the seeds are the words of Jesus. Jesus is standing in a boat and he's teaching. And it's like he's casting out seed. He's planting seed. His words are like the seed. The word of God is the seed going forth. And the soil, which is really the center place of, of this parable, the soil is the human heart. The seed of the emotions. Those deep desires within the core of who had the heart, the human heart. That's what the soil is. The birds are Satan or the evil one and his demons. The crop is, is the fruit of the spirit, really, the fruit that is produced by good soil. And notice what happens in this parable. First, you have the path. The seeds are given forth, and it lands on a path. That is, the meaning of that is that it's, a, it's, it's talking about the resistant heart, the hard heart. The path that just kind of bounces there. This is really those who would, would hear, but they don't really want to know what it means. It's just there. And they fall victim to the enemy of our souls. The, the truth just doesn't penetrate. It just gets lays there and it gets snatched up. But somehow their heart has become hardened. Kind of like Pharaoh in the Old Testament. He hardened his heart. And so God hardened his heart. He had a hard heart. So there's no way he was going to understand what was going on with, with all those um, plagues that came upon him. He couldn't understand what God was doing because he had a hard heart. His heart was hardened. People can still get a hardened heart. And the truth goes forth, but it doesn't take any root. It just bounces there. That's a resistant heart. And then you have this rocky soil of the heart where, where the heart is shallow. And what we need in this is, is community to help each other. Get the roots sinking in to that soil of the heart. We need a spiritual family to help us to till the soil. So you have this rocky soil. And we need a spiritual family to help us identify the rocks in our life. What are the rocks that I need to take care of? A rocky soil heart is that heart which the roots are not going deeper. Because they haven't taken care of the soil. And there's rocks there. So we need to pray for each other to strengthen our faith together and identify those rocks because the rocks aren't the problem. Identifying the rocks and taking care of them is the problem. So we all have problems. We all have things that can become rocks if we don't take care of them. And the choice is ours. We can take care of the rocks in our heart or we can stumble over them. But this parable is talking about the heart and identifying the things that might be preventing me from really understanding the word of God. And the things that he is seeking to say to me. And then you have this thorny soil. The, the preoccupations. We get choked by earthly cares. Verse 22 mentions deceit or deception. That, that's another tool of the enemy to, to put a cloud of deception over us. 
And there's so much deception in the world today. So much deception. And you know that the worst part about deception, I, I think, is not knowing you're deceived. So how do you know you're deceived? We need each other to identify that. That, hey, you might be believing the wrong thing there. Let's study the Word of God together and let's help each other in our hearts become good soil where the seed of God, the Word of God, takes root. Because if, if there's bad fruit in my life, it's not a fruit problem. It's a root problem. I need to find out what are the roots that are causing that bad fruit and what are the rocks that are preventing the roots of God's Word from going deeper. We want good soil. And who makes the soil? God does. Who makes the seed? God does. And God plants the seed, and God waters the seed with living water, and he brings sunshine for the seeds. What's our part then? What's our responsibility in, in all of it, in this, in this parable? This is the key. What's our part in this? Take care of the soil. Do everything I possibly can to make sure my heart is soft and going deeper, that the soil of my heart Whatever I'm reading in his word, whatever I'm hearing from him, it'll take root because I'm doing my part to protect my heart and make sure that I'm doing everything I can to make that soil rich. And we need a spiritual family to help us with that, to help us grow, to produce fruit so that the fruit will have seeds that will plant more fruit, more seed. It's a multiplication thing, right? The fruit, <coughs> the purpose of it is to plant more seeds. And so if God produces fruit in my life because the soil of my heart is good and he's bringing the fruit, but love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, that kind of fruit, Galatians 6 kind of fruit, if God is bringing those things, the, the, every, every other people will see the fruit and they'll be drawn to it and eat the fruit. We're planting seeds. We become sowers because we're multiplying. The fruit produces seed to multiply. That's our mission. That's our purpose, to be fruitful and multiply so that others would be drawn in to the kingdom. And if you want to sum it up, it's really, it's about being more like Jesus. Just be more like Jesus. And that's my prayer. God, help us to be more like you, Jesus. One last thing I'd like to mention this morning. In a family, we help each other become more like Jesus so that we can become more fruitful. Hebrews 2.11 says, So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters, spiritual family, together. A safe place to belong together as we grow together. So when we are becoming more like Jesus, we're going to become more passionate about what he is passionate about. If we really love God, if we really love Jesus, we're going to care about what he really cares about. And you know what he cares about. He cares about my life being fruitful. That my life will be looking more and more like Jesus. The compassion, the mercy, the love of Jesus that I extend to other people. And I plant seeds in their life that they can find some hope and some encouragement in the truth of who God is and how much he loves us. We multiply. We're fruitful to God's eternal glory. We become seed planting sowers and we're on mission together as a family. Now in this next little season, we probably need some, you know, just some focused prayer and healing time. But the whole goal, you know, you're in the army of God and we have a hospital wing and sometimes people need to be in the hospital and heal up. But the whole purpose is get back in the army. We have a mission ahead of us. We have work to do in Trinity County to expand the kingdom of God and to extend his love to people who haven't, been taste, taste, haven't tasted it yet. We're on mission together. And when we do that, we will bring glory to God and we'll sense his pleasure. So let me close with this image. Some of you have seen The Chosen, right? Some of you have watched the whole thing. I love The Chosen. One of my favorite scenes so far in The Chosen is when they're all sitting around the campfire. Remember the scene? Some of you that have seen it? They're sitting around the campfire, and all of a sudden they start picking on Matthew, the tax collector. They're picking on Matthew. And it just gets worse and worse, and they're, they're picking on this guy. Matthew's not saying a whole lot. you know. He's just, okay. 
And it gets to the place where they're so mad at each other. There's, there's all this argument going on that two of them stand up and it looks like they're about ready to go into a fist fight moment. They're angry with each other. They're sitting around the campfire and they're complaining and quarreling with each other. And it all started with this guy, Matthew, the tax collector. Why did Jesus make him be on the team? And in that, the, my favorite part of that movie is, is when Jesus, who's been out there doing ministry, and he's exhausted. He's just totally spent himself doing ministry to people. And here's this campfire ring going on with all this quarreling and bickering. And Jesus walks into the picture, and he looks over at the campfire. And I expected the, the writers of that to, to have him say something like, guys, quit bickering. We got work to do. But he didn't say that. Actually, he didn't say anything. He just looked at them all with his face of sadness. I think they got the message. We have work to do. There are people that need the love of Jesus. There are people in our county that are really hurting and need the love of Jesus. There are people that need the ministry that he wants us to be his hands and feet to extend. So we have work to do ahead. And I'm so glad that you are here, that God has mobilized an army. That is what I'm excited about. You look around this morning, God is mobilizing an army to impact Trinity County for his glory. I believe that with all my heart. Yes. And I'm glad you're a part of it. A question to close with this morning. Ask yourself this question. What, what can I do in my own personal life? What can I do to really soften the soil of my heart and make sure I'm doing everything I can for good soil to take place there? Are there any thorns you need to pull out? Any worries? Any anxieties? Anything causing resistance in your heart? Any unforgiveness? And you might not be able to forgive whoever comes to mind in that right now in this moment. I hope you can, but make a plan. Commit yourself to God. I'm going to work a plan of forgiveness and healing and restoration if I can. Now ask what needs to happen in the soil of your heart. If you're tuned into the Holy Spirit right now, I'm sure you're hearing something. This is... One thing you could do, get rid of that rock. Get rid of that piece of anger. Get rid of that thorn of worry. Lean in. Lean into God and lean into the family even for help. And I want to ask us to pray for opportunities this week even to be a, a fruitful sower. And you might not feel up for it. You might not have the courage for it. You might still need some emotional healing. But sometimes the, the most effective means that God uses to bring emotional healing in our own lives is when we reach out to somebody else and be his conduit to extend grace and mercy to another person who's hurting. That's healing. So who is that for you? What can you do this week to be a fruitful sower? I, I want to invite the worship team to come back and, and lead us in, in a closing song today. And I, I just want to lead us in a prayer. Would, would you pray with me? Father, help us as a church family to really get from you what, is, what it is you want us to to glean in terms of our part in participating in family. Sometimes conversations like this and passages like this are hard because we, we just want to stay by ourselves. We live on the West Coast. We are independent. We don't need other people. But God, that's not what you say. That's not what your word says. We need each other. We need to be in community. We need other people to speak in our lives. We need other people to pray for us. So I pray that you would bring those people to us. I pray for every single person in the room right now that if they don't have a friend that is willing to encourage them and to point out the blind spot, that that, that friend would come and that relationship would develop. And whatever friendships are already in existence, that you would take them deeper, that we can love each other enough to be real and honest and transparent and talk through our things and get prayer with each other and as we seek to be a family, God, we know it's what you want. Jesus, you prayed for it in John 17, that we would be one as you are one. The unity factor can bring you glory, and we, we want that, Father. Would you do it? We can't do it on our own. Would you be our Heavenly Father that empowers us to be the kind of family that you want us to be, the kind of family, Jesus, you made possible? 
Help us to lean into that and bring you glory for it. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Can you stand and sing with me?